Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Prem Talks Ball. Today, we have with us one of the world's top nutritionists. He's worked with Premier League clubs like Chelsea and West Ham. So, he's going to tell us how to live a better, longer and healthier life, hopefully, through food. Or maybe if you just want to look like a Premier League footballer, then I, I think he's got that covered as well. So, Matt Jones, welcome to Prem Talks Ball. Thank you very much, Prem. It's great to be here. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can share some uh, some valuable information today. Yeah. Now, Matt, uh, there's a lot that I want to talk to you about. Uh, obviously, the elephant in the room will be, uh, you know, uh, questions about the Premier Premier League footballer, what they're eating, what they're drinking, and their, their habits to look the way they do. Uh, but uh, first up, tell me a little bit about yourself. How, do, how you know, where do you grow up uh, and how do you end up as a nutritionist and one of the world's premier ones at that? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, growing up, I uh, I played football, so a relatively high level, but uh, also played rugby and, and during the summer cricket and pretty much every sport, like like most uh, most most kids in England or across the world, really just really fascinated and interested in sport and, and played everything. And and to be honest, it was probably the fact that I played everything that led to my injuries. So um i i tore my acl my, my cruciate ligament at the age of 17 and then again at the age of uh, 18 um and it was during that the rehabilitation process that i started started to become fascinated by nutrition really so um at that time i was involved in a fairly big football academy um so during my injury i was uh, being treated by physiotherapists and strength conditioning coaches and even talking with psychologists but no one ever told me what to eat. So I found myself gaining weight. Um, obviously, my activity levels went from being incredibly high to nothing at all uh, on crutches. Correct. Um, so yeah, I was gaining weight and it started to, started to impact my mental health and I just felt really, really bad. So I started to, to read about nutrition. Initially, back in those days, it was like magazines, you know, like bodybuilding magazines and those kind of things. And How um, long back are we talking? So this was when I was uh, 18. So I'm now 35. So <laughs> quite, quite, quite some time ago. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I started reading about nutrition and became fascinated really. And initially to try and fix myself, but then I started to obviously started to expand that. Like how, how can I get stronger? Um, because like what part of the rehabilitation process was to, to strengthen the, the, the knee, the, the muscles around the, the knee basically. And, um, how you can use food to, to heal your body and, and strengthen muscles and uh, improve health, really. Um, and then, obviously, as a result of those injuries, like the first time I tore my ACL, I, I bounced back straight away and, and almost like too too well in a way because I, I rushed back uh, and then did the same injury uh, again. And the second time hit me really hard. Uh, after that re rehabilitation, I like. I couldn't commit to tackles. I, I, it would, I just couldn't play the same. So um, I, it was at that point that I kind of left the the playing side um, and started to focus on like alternative routes, if you like. Um, so I took on a, a, an undergraduate degree in sports science because at that time, sports nutrition or football nutrition wasn't really a thing. There was not many or if any people doing football nutrition so I started off quite broad, uh, did my undergraduate degree in sports science, but it was really the sports and nutrition modules within that course that like stimulated me and, and got my interest. Uh, so I went on to do a, a master's degree in uh, sports and nutrition. Um, and during that time, I was working as an intern with Liverpool Football Club and also uh, the Welsh Rugby Union. Um, and that was incredible experience. It opened up a, a vast network, of course, and uh, I developed some really strong relationships, uh, which allowed me then to, to kind of step into into the world of professional sport as a as a sports nutritionist consultant to begin with. Um, so yeah, I, I stepped out, and my my first kind of club was Stoke City, uh, and that was back in the the golden era, if you like, when they were performing well in the Premier League, and uh, we had some some very good seasons. Uh, I then the Rory to... Delap throwing it throwing uh, era is that is that the time we're talking? Yeah, about? so it was the back end of his his era, yeah, and the, moving into like the the, the Peter Crouch era uh, and those kind of things. Yeah. Um, Jed and Shakiri and those those kind of days. It was it was good. No, fantastic. It was great experience. Um, I then went to the the Middle East and 
spent some time in Brazil with Flamengo and, and the, the Saudi Arabian national team up until the 2018 World Cup, uh, and then to America with the University of Oregon, uh, back to England with Brentford, uh, Chelsea and, and West Ham. Um, yeah, so a variety of different experiences that have kind of shaped my, uh, shaped my philosophy as, as a practitioner and, and shaped my, my life, if you like. Uh, it's interesting though, Matt, that you mentioned there was, so this is probably early to mid 2000s that we're talking about. You said uh, when you probably left football and, uh, and went into uh, nutrition, but you said that there, there weren't too many people focusing on nutrition at the time, which kind of surprises me because I, I know for a fact that certainly in England, in the Premier League, Arsene Wenger is somebody who got that big change, right? Who was someone who uh, actually asked the players to dial in their nutrition because he he kind of saw that this is going to this is the future essentially right or what everyone's doing today so i'm surprised that uh, not too many people even at that level at elite sport level were uh, were actually focusing on on their nutrition so was it was it haywire in the sense that uh, players wouldn't really care about what they're eating and things like that for performance yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they didn't care. I, it was probably more um, a lack of knowledge. Yeah, more of a lack of knowledge, really. Like sports nutrition in relation to the other sports sciences is the the new dog, if you like the the, the new kid yeah. on the block. It's it's, uh, it's the like we probably have 20, 20 years of research in of good research in that space. You know, whereas sports mm -hmm. science maybe 50 years or whatever it might be. So it's it's the new dog. So um, you're right, there, there was like cultural leaders like, um, yeah, Arsene Wenger. Uh, I mean, sports science, you have like Sam Allardyce, for example, like surprisingly, he was probably one of the first to adopt sports science. And um, it, you get these 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 big moments in, uh, in football where people uh, take on uh, these new things and these new ideas, which is which is obviously fantastic. And I think now it's becoming uh, like increasingly popular because players who experienced sports nutrition as a player or, or working with a sports nutritionist, they they as a player, they then adopt those ideas and then become coaches themselves. And they, they understand uh, the impact that it can have and the benefits that it, it can have to them as a coach and, and their team. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's quickly transitioned. Um, in, in that way and progressed which is great but um yeah there's uh, there was that that moment uh, in time where awesome Wenger really like um stimulated change, change that. the game yeah. yeah change that game yeah yeah uh all right uh let, let's talk about uh, a premier league players uh, nutrition mat can you walk me through what's generally happening from the time that they wake up to the time that they're going to bed? Because I assume that according to their schedule, depending on whether it's match day, depending on whether it's rest day, or of course, training day, the amount of calories that they're eating. So therefore, probably the amount of meals that they're having is also different. Uh, so can you tell me what they're eating, how they, how much, uh, how, how many calories they typically would consume to look the way they do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess first things first, the most important thing to say about nutrition is it's context specific. Um, okay. That's why, that's why nutrition can be so confusing uh, because it, it is, it's just dependent on the context uh, and people often overlook the context. Uh, I, I give the example here of like people saying like, or categorizing foods as good or bad foods. Um, well, there is no such thing as, as good and bad foods, to be honest. It's, it depends on the context. Um, say, for example, uh, a McDonald's Big Mac. Um, for me and you sat at a desk here right now, a, a McDonald's Big Mac is probably not a good idea. But if Correct. you're stuck at the top of a mountain um, with no, no food, then a Big Mac could quite literally save your life. So in that context, it's, it's a good food. So I, I just wanted to, to highlight that because uh, nutrition can often be be confused because people overlook the context in which a recommendation is given. So um, in, in the football context, um, like a player is is an individual and their, their energy expenditure will be individual as well. It'd be very different. Um, so on average, probably around 3,400, 3,500 calories. But within that, you have players who are very small 
uh, and don't move Correct. all that much. So they don't run that much. So they might be down at like 2,900, 2,800 calories per day. Whereas you might have uh, a huge central midfielder who is covering, who, who runs like 13 kilometers per game and, and clocks up a great amount of volume during their training week as well. And they could be up at 3,800 calories per day. So there's, there's a, a huge variance within the, within the team. And to be honest, that's the most difficult part as a as sports nutrition sports nutritionist as a practitioner on the ground is individualizing that within the the group uh, context. It's it, it can get very very difficult. Um, so it, from an energy perspective, yes, yeah, some, somewhere between two thousand eight hundred and and three thousand eight hundred perhaps calories per day um, on average three thousand four hundred. Let's say. How many calories? Uh... For example, since you said that it's very context specific and depends on the player, like, uh, you know, uh, Perlo when he was playing uh, wouldn't be, uh, you know, expending so much energy as, say, a Yaya Toure, for example, or someone like that. You know what I'm saying? So, for example, can you tell me for a box to box midfielder like Jude Bellingham, how many calories is he eating? And can you also tell me, because I'm sure you guys track that, how many calories do they burn? while they're say typically on a training day or uh, on a match day yeah so i assume it's more during, on a training day uh yeah well it depends on the, the training day like we have like overload days if you like where they the energy expenditure is pretty much the same as uh as a game day because they try and mm. like replicate the game essentially uh so within uh, within the periodized training block th there will be those days where it is incredibly hard um mm. But yeah, during a game, somewhere between like 1,500 calories, let's say, um, and 70 or 75, 80% of those calories come from carbohydrate because they're, they're exercising, they're, they're training at a very high intensity. So the, the glycogen stores or the petrol tanks within the muscle uh, are the main fuel source um, at that point. And that's where fatigue can set in quite quickly because those stores of energy, those stores of fuel are limited. Um, and you can burn through them in 70, 75 minutes. So, um, it can, yeah, it can, it can be very intense. Hmm. Interesting. And I also, you know, uh, it, it's, it's so true because even in my own experience, it's so context specific because, uh, so I want to ask you about the protein consumption for footballers as well, because obviously it's important for, for, for recovery and, uh, and for the muscle to maintain the muscle that, uh, that, that they have, but. I'll tell you something like I, I I'm actually someone who a couple of years back I had a surgery um, I had this issue uh, which is called a uh, hemorrhoids and it I had I had that for for quite a few years for about seven or eight years and I actually got it very young when I was 17 and then I somehow it was it was all right on some on some days but uh, a couple of years back, it, the the bleeding, etc., it, it got too much, so I had to immediately be operated on, and uh, it had kind of reached the reached the later stage. Uh, and so for me, I I know that I have that tendency. So for me, the the thing that I know I have to focus on is fiber. You know, people talk about <laughs> about protein and carbs and and fat, but for me, I need to make sure that my digestion is 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 smooth. Uh, you know, and so that's very, it's very specific to people. So, which is why when, you know, when you said that uh, it's not one size fits all at all. So there's certain people who have certain tendencies uh, as human beings. So do you also have to work along with that? Like when a player is, uh, you know, maybe they are lactose intolerant or something like that. Like, do you have to then specifically uh, speak to every single player and kind of design something which suits their body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, taking into account their their requirements, so their requirements for calories, like macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, fat. Right, the way we're down to like micronutrients, so vitamins, minerals. We'll uh, we'll screen them at like at the beginning of the season and mid season, so blood draws, blood analysis. Uh, to find out um, deficiencies and, and biomarker testing and uh, like allergy or intolerance testing as well, if necessary. Um, so yeah, it, it's very detailed. Uh, but you don't also you also have to account for um, their like cultural uh, habits and preferences as well. And um, you almost have to 
account account for those elements as well because um yeah people are well it's an international game now of course and uh, you need to make uh, a player feel as comfortable as possible so it, in in those instances it's about like optimizing their comfort zone in a way um because if you take a player from south america and and put him into to like deliver him to london for example you want to make him feel comfortable and, and and allow him to eat foods that he's familiar with um and uh, yeah and, and that way he's going to perform well and uh, and feel feel good as well how many meals uh, uh premier league players? so let's talk about your time at west ham united because i know for a fact that uh, your time there and i'm sure that's not a coincidence that they it they, you know with uh, with david moyes there he's he also had some pretty good success in europe as well uh and so that surely can't be a coincidence right i'm sure that nutrition did play a big part uh in 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 how well the west ham team performed uh so how many meals uh would you say a, a player's having like do they have breakfast lunch and dinner or there's no such thing as breakfast lunch and dinner like a bodybuilder it's meal one meal two meal three up to meal six <laughs> Yeah, uh, so if you think uh, they have like 3,500 calories to consume uh, per day um, and they have like multiple opportunities to do that, like it, you just have to kind of figure out how how they're able to consume that amount of calories within the day. So certain individuals will be able to eat large meals. So, but then others prefer, so, so let's say for example, if, if they train in the morning at like 10 or 11 o'clock, some players are able to eat a, a large breakfast, like a thousand calorie breakfast uh, and train perfectly fine. Whereas others will have a smaller breakfast. And in that way, they would then have to eat more frequently uh, for the rest of the day in order to meet those energy requirements. Whereas others can eat a thousand calories at breakfast, a thousand calories lunch, a thousand calories uh, in the evening meal. And then they they ultimately just have like a small snack prior to sleep and, the, and then they're, they're done for the day um so again it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because it, it, it's very uh it depends it, it all depends on the the individual's preferences and, and their and what's comfortable for them but what i would say is the the three main meals um are obviously incredibly important uh, but then when, when we look at uh like meal timing um we also have to consider the impact of carbohydrate and, and protein on both performance uh, and then recovery as well so let's take carbohydrate uh, for example so if they're training in the morning then their largest carbohydrate meal should come prior to and then after training um, because carbohydrate is a fuel for the muscle so it's the the the, the fuel for intense actions um, and if you imagine you have like a small petrol tank within your muscle when you eat carbohydrate pasta rice potatoes the fuel tank increases and then when you put your foot down on the accelerator pedal and sprint you run hard then it goes down and it takes roughly 70 minutes of intense activity to completely deplete those stores so at breakfast the objective is to top up those tanks um so you go into training with it with a full tank uh, and then perhaps after training it's it's somewhere like here but then after training at, at lunch then you have to refill the tank so there's those carbohydrate rich meals are skewed towards training. So before and then after training to, to fuel and then refuel. Later in the day, the carbohydrate um, quantity is reduced slightly because the requirements requirements of the day change because let's be honest, in the afternoon and evening, they just sit at home and play PlayStation. So they're not, they're not sprinting too much. Um, and then, so that, that's the carbohydrate element. Uh, and then protein. Uh, so to optimize muscle growth and repair, so, so protein is like the bricks, the building blocks that your body requires to uh, grow and repair muscle uh, and also various other things as well. But if we just take muscle um, and then if you look at the research, um, ideally you'd have around four protein rich meals per day um, and they'd be evenly spaced across uh, across the day. So when you consume around 0.4 grams per kilo, or let's say 30 grams of protein, muscle growth and repair processes are elevated or they're maximized for around four or five hours. So if you take breakfast, max muscle protein synthesis is maximized four or five hours, and then four or five hours afterwards, you have to stimulate muscle growth and repair again. So if you take that like timeline, then you have breakfast, then lunch after training uh, and then dinner and then before bed uh, another another protein rich meal 
Um, so that would kind of dictate the, the meal frequency, if you like. But then the composition of that meal uh, will differ depending on how, uh, how many calories that each player is able to consume at, at the meal or how comfortable they are at consuming large or, or small meals. So it gets fairly uh, complex. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how many meal? Uh, how many meals are players having at the club together? Like breakfast or uh, post uh, training? Is, is it together or and dinner is at home? Yeah. yeah so uh, breakfast and lunch will always be be served uh, to the players at the club. Um, but we also had a period of time where we also like catered for their evening meal as well. So we offered them the opportunity to take away a meal that we had like pre prepared for them, um, so they could easily have their evening meal and their, their evening snack pre-prepared for them as well. So, so literally all of their meals uh, are covered. And uh, I mean, let's be honest, the Premier League, if you're playing in the Premier League, you're, you're earning pretty well, right? And this is literally in a sense, like spending money on your livelihood uh, for them. I'm talking about hiring personal chefs and things like that. I mean, I'm assuming that most Premier League players aren't in the kitchen cooking cooking their own breakfast, right? So how many of them have uh, have, have private chefs? And then do you have to, uh, uh, as part of, uh, as being the nutritionist, have to kind of uh, coordinate with uh, the, the chefs as well? And do they sometimes also, like, for example, the likes of, I don't know, who's a who's a real fitness specimen, I guess. You can't really think past Ronaldo, right? So I'm mean, Assuming that Ronaldo would also, obviously, he's got someone at Al Nasser at the club as well, but then maybe he's got somebody who's he, uh, that he's consulting as a nutritionist uh, away from the club as well. So, uh, do you have to then work in conjunction with them? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you're absolutely right. I think in the last five, ten years, like people, uh, football players or, or athletes in general see themselves more as a business. So, they build a team around them. Uh, and they'll invest in themselves as as a business. So it started with agents, of course, and then it started, then it can, kind of expanded to like massage therapists and personal physiotherapists and like personal trainers or strength conditioning coaches, and then evolved to to, to nutritionists as well. So they have this team around them, and uh, and you'll get that with with big players, and and m most players now, to be honest, will have a support team around them, um, which is amazing. Actually, it's it, as you say, like. Why not? You're a business. You have a short career, so you need to to be the best and get the best out of yourself. So, um, but it does offer like a degree of complexity for someone working at the club because you have to obviously be in in constant communication with them and develop great relationships um, and maintain and establish uh, and maintain those relationships. Yeah. So uh, there's constant conversations between um, ourselves at the club and and the private chefs and. Um, and obviously, uh, the, the private chef is in, in a slightly difficult position because he's probably catering for the entire family. Um, so you have Correct. perhaps like the, the, the mother of the player at the, at the home, the, the, the wife and the kids and, uh, and the player himself. Um, so a whole host of different energy and, and uh, tastes uh, to, to kind of cater for. Um, and they can uh yeah they, they can often get a, a little bit wrong uh, because a chef is also judged on how well uh, how good the food tastes um, and to make food taste good you have to oftentimes add fats and add salt and, and sugar perhaps in order to make it taste good which can uh, often uh, complicate matters let's say and if we like go back to what i previously discussed that the the lowest activity level for a footballer at least in europe let's say um, is in the evening or in the afternoon, the evening, because as I say, they go home and they relax and uh, because training is typically in the morning. Um, so the, the lower calorie meal should be in the evening um, and the higher calorie meal should come like towards the, the start in the middle of the day. Um, and yet when they go home, they, they're, they're, they're with their chefs, they have three course meals. Um, it can quickly uh, become, a, become a problem, let's say. Um, so there's constant communication there and uh, we're always like providing uh, like information on how to reduce the energy density of, of meals perhaps. And, but uh, again, at, at certain times, um, the day before a game, let's say when we need to optimize glycogen stores, then yeah, you can have like past 
parties and those kind of things and uh, and they can get away with it but not all the time tell me about tell me about discipline i mean you don't have to name the players but uh, have you have you had to uh, have, have there been problems with that or are they all now in today's day and age like you said because they understand it's a business they have a short career they need to invest in themselves and take care of their bodies but i'm sure that sometimes with the younger guys not everybody can be uh, you know as disciplined as say you know the ronaldos of this world so have there been cases like that and then and then how do you kind of uh, how do you handle the situation there yeah um I, I, yeah there's definitely definitely examples with within every team where like certain players just I, for, for one reason or another they don't, don't appreciate or understand the impact of the food they're eating on, on their performance uh, or they just don't care and, and just prefer to um, eat based on taste rather than function um, so I, I think as, as a, a sports nutritionist or a football nutritionist you kind of you kind of accept that's going to happen um, and in those instances you just have to try and develop a relationship like a trusting relationship um, and in, like educate um, just get them to to understand the impacts of the food they're eating uh, and how it might impact them um, and, and almost peel back a few layers of the onion and find out what really motivates them um, and it might not be anything to do with football it might be fine it might be money like it, they uh, they might be like wanting to extend their career or like get a new contract or get a, more money on the next contract and then you almost have to develop your story around how eating better might lead to better performances on the pitch and that might lead to more money um or like in certain cases it might be the appearance it might be aesthetics it might be how they look uh, they might be like big on social media and <laughs> they, they might care about their skin so how you can then build a story about how nutrition can impact the way you look and collagen synthesis and the way your skin appears and on those kind of things and so it's about really developing that relationship with the player and, and understanding them as an individual. And then you can work a story uh, around around that factor um, and then start to influence them positively. There's so many players, you know, who uh, like Eden Hazard is, he was one of my my favorite players uh, to watch, such talent. And I think he's, he's actually like Thierry Henry recently said, probably the best player in one-on-one -on -one situations that you know, the Premier League's really ever seen. And then there's also the likes of, say, um, at a slightly lower rung, uh, in my opinion, I'd say uh, Samir Nasri and, uh, and and so many other players who kind of would have had the potential to certainly have like uh, such, such accomplished, even more accomplished careers. Uh, and when people talk about hazard, they often talk about injuries, but then ultimately, it's all, it's an amalgamation of everything, right? Like your lifestyle, if you're not slept well, all of that, uh, how you're eating, ultimately that's that that that's going to make you more prone to injuries. I'm not saying that that's the only factor. It can happen to anyone, uh, like it did to you at a very young age. Uh, but ultimately, food it it does affect, uh, uh, and I think that this, we've we would have had, we would have seen a lot of great players have even better careers. Uh, would, would you agree with that absolutely yeah definitely and i think you'll you'll find that many of those players that in when they're 40 or 50 they they, they realize they, they suddenly at that age realize that they they could and probably should have done something different uh like you mentioned two examples there and i, I think of uh dimitri paye as well uh, I, i'm not sure if yeah. you've seen but he's now in brazil um when yeah. he was in england when he was in England, he he did really well, like technically, but physically he was really bad. Uh, his his nutrition was 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 bad, uh, but now he's almost completely transformed himself, and and uh, he he looks completely different to begin with. But now he's also regained some of that form, and and now he's playing consistently well in Brazil. Um, so he almost had this like epitome, like what what's the word like uh, epiphany, like a epiphany moment. Um, when he's like 32 perhaps and I, i'm doing things wrong like i need to prolong my career so i'm going to make a, make a change uh thankfully it was while he was still playing that, that he was able to he had that moment but um I, I guess some players will will have it uh too late unfortunately yeah yeah no i mean 
uh, it, it totally does play. I, I, I'm not sure if you know, but uh, the best player in our country, I mean, certainly the, the, the most popular, the face of Indian football, uh, and has been for many, many years now. His name is Sunil Chetri, uh, right? Uh, he's our captain. He's been our captain for like te- about 10 years now. And, and he's actually uh, 39 and he's still going pretty strong. And if you look at him and he's kind of, you know, looked at as the Ronaldo of our country where he's all about discipline. Uh, he won't eat cake on his birthday and, it's, you know, things like that. So that really tells you uh, that, yeah, nutrition is, is, is it, it, that's that's where we're at if you want to have a uh, proper long career. Uh, tell me about, uh, I, I know, Matt, that you've worked in, uh, you, you were mentioning different cultures as well. Uh, haven't you worked in uh brazil and in, in now in the you know middle east as well so and in england of course so how how do cultures uh, affect food because i'll tell you something now i follow some i have a few bodybuilders and it's probably uh, by and large the americans that i'm talking about here so which is why uh, the meals all probably look the same but i think that even even with indians uh it's all about you know oats and chicken and rice and there's like probably those five or six things in there which will be top quality and everybody's just eating that so but when you go to a different country where where the culture is entirely different as i'm sure it is where you are right now which uh, in the uae uh uh, do people eat differently and then you uh, are they eating different meals uh to the the regular like i said oats and chicken and rice but they're still obviously uh, getting the same kind of energy and nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like you bring up a, a very good point there. Like uh, I think one of the advantages that I've had across my career is um, I've, I've worked in many different, different countries uh, uh, on different continents as well. So I've been exposed to different cultures and, and different cuisines. Um, and I quickly had to learn that food is essentially just a vehicle to deliver energy and and nutrients so macronutrients and uh micronutrients vitamins and minerals so that the vehicle looks different it could be a honda or it could be a bmw or a mercedes Uh, but ultimately it's delivering the same same thing so you almost have to look past the food and look at the nutrients that it's delivering so um in like in the Middle East and in India, like you have like biryani, for example. So biryani yeah. is just a combination of, of rice and uh, chicken, hopefully. Uh, and then- And so there's protein uh, and carbs both. And, and some fats as well. Um, so you, you look at the, the carbohydrate content, the protein content and the, the, ca- the fat and the calorie content. Uh, and then you compare that in England, it might just be rice and chicken and broccoli, for example. But the, the, the macronutrient, the energy content is, is the same. Um, but it looks different. Um, so you, you almost, as I say, you have to look beyond the, uh, beyond the food itself. And, and, um, I think, uh, uh, so my, my master's degree was like nutrition science or nutri, uh, like dietetics in a way. So you, uh, you almost have to look at food as, and, and when you look at a plate of food, you see numbers, uh, like there was a period of time where like I almost started to develop some kind of like eating disorder because when you look at a plate, you just see the numbers. You you see calories uh, and car- grams of carbohydrate, protein, and fat, and and the micronutrients as well. Um, and you just get paranoid uh, about it. Absolutely, and I'm not saying like everyone needs to do that, but I'm just saying that uh, as as a practitioner, it's important that you have an understanding uh, that that food is is just a vehicle to del- deliver deliver calories and energy and, and, and nutrients as well. So um, it, depending on where you are in the world, um, it's uh, the, the, the vehicle, the food looks very different. Mm. Yeah. Tell me, Mac, can anyone who chooses to with the right kind of, uh, with the right kind of diet and exercise and what would that look like for you to, if you want to look like a Premier League footballer? Uh, can you, can you tell me like a, I know it's obviously it's it's simple in uh, in theory, difficult in practice, obviously. Uh, but how how do you how do you do it? And the reason I ask is because I, I mean theoretically anyone could would be able to do that if they follow the same habits. But for example, I'm you know 27 years old. I've, I've played a bit of football at a modest level myself, uh, but haven't really been as active as I was in my say late teens or maybe early 20s. The last few years since I started working and things like that. 
So if you have to get back on that uh, bandwagon, or if somebody is just starting out, say at 32 or 33, I don't know if you know about this guy called David Goggins. He's one of the uh, you know world's top ultra marathoners, and that that guy is like I think 50 years old now, and he can he can still uh, you know uh, outrun uh, like teenagers. So okay, can you can you transform your your body with nutrition at any given point if you just put your mind to it? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think people create this narrative that I'm I'm too old or. Uh, like I, I can't, I can't do it. But ultimately, if you commit to being consistent with something, whatever it might be, uh, in life, if if you like just repetitive, whatever it is, uh, you're going to get better. Um, so, yeah, everything is in life is about repetition. Um, and if you can repeat basic behaviors every single day, like healthy habits, if you like, uh, you're gonna you're gonna progress um, definitely. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. Looking like, looking like a Premier League footballer might take uh, a little more than just focusing on your on your diet. I assume you got to like work out like a like a footballer as well. Yeah, of course. The, there's there's many aspects to it. Um, I mean, if you think about it holistically, like nutrition is just a small part of the puzzle. Uh, like the training, the the sleep, the recovery, um, like the the mental side of it. Um, like people people often overlook the, the the mental side of being a professional athlete. Um, like I'm, I'm exposed to a, a tiny fraction of what they're exposed to. Um, but like the criticism, the social media, um, the, the stresses and strains that they, they undergo, um, like not being able to walk down the streets, uh, after losing a football match, uh, you know, it, the, the, those like mental pressures are, are like incredible, but yeah, nutrition is just a, a small part of the puzzle, like training, progressive overloads in, in resistance training programs. Um, yeah, sleep, uh, all, all critically important, but they all come together nicely. Uh, and if you're consistent with all of them, you will, uh, you will absolutely progress. What's your, what's your take on supplements, Matt? Uh, and particularly I want to talk, I'm going to focus on uh, protein powders because this is just, uh, it's, it's a never ending debate, isn't it? In the world, there's, there's people who say that they are absolutely safe. There's, there's people who say that you don't really need them at all. Uh, you can get the exact same thing from food. I mean, there's a reason why they're called supplements. It's, it's supplementing something in your diet. It's not, it, it's not a whole food as such, right? There's just the one, one thing that you're getting from it certainly if you're having uh like an isolate protein which i'm sure that's the highest quality protein that the, i'm sure the footballers also consume how, so how, what's what's your take on that and do you uh like how, how many premier league footballers uh, that you've worked with are taking protein powders yeah so so protein powders are, is an interesting one really because i don't really consider protein powder to be a supplement to, to be honest I, I think it's just a okay an alternative an alternative source of protein. So if you think of mm. the different types of protein that you can consume, you can consume like meat or fish, eggs, dairy products, um, like beans, pulses, uh, but then you also have whey protein. So um, it's just a more practical, convenient source of protein. Uh, so I don't necessarily consider that to be, to be a supplement because it's just providing more protein uh, in a more convenient manner. So let's say for example, you're traveling um, you can't access the kitchen. Uh, you can't cook a chicken breast. It's probably not practical or convenient to take a kind of tuna or like a yogurt with you. Um, so taking a, a powdered protein product is a, a practical and convenient way to meet your protein requirements um, simply. So uh, I, I don't necessarily consider it a, a supplement. It's just a, an alternative protein source. Um, but you bring up a good point about safety. Uh, supplement safety is is absolutely paramount. And uh, these days, um, contamination within supplements is is increasing. Uh, I guess the, the the main issue that we have is that uh, the raw ingredients are becoming more expensive, um, and therefore uh, companies are purchasing the the ingredients from big factories in China, where they're also manufacturing like steroids perhaps within the same facility uh, and it's the, the chances of cross contamination increase um, and that's therefore impacting uh, products uh, across the globe. So um, investing in products or supplements that are like tested for banned substances 
uh, by third parties like informed sports um nsf as an example um is is vitally important for all professional athletes not not just footballers but uh, all all professional athletes um so yeah protein powder i, I wouldn't necessarily call it a, a, a supplement um if you can meet your protein requirements from food perfect uh, but there are certain certain circumstances where people can't for whatever reason and therefore adding uh, whey protein into your diet that day uh, can help you help move you towards that requirement so um i guess if, if we think about nutrition on, on the most basic level if i was to describe nutrition for, to a five-year-old um, i would say that each day you wake up with empty buckets so you wake up with empty an empty bucket for calories for carbohydrate protein fats vitamins minerals and fiber and, and water as well and your objective each and every day is to make suitable food and fluid choices to fill up those buckets so you you fill up you take breakfast for example and, and you, you fill it a third of the way you make uh, but then you not only do you have to think about the calorie bucket you have to think about all those other buckets as well so making good food choices that are going to provide all of the nutrients and the vitamins and minerals of course uh, is is incredibly important so uh, if you're short on protein adding that protein uh protein supplement to top up the bucket for protein uh, is going to be beneficial obviously there's consequences to under consuming calories but then also to over consuming calories as well because when you over consume the bucket overflows and the excess is going to be stored unfortunately so um yeah yeah when there's a spillover that happens in the uh in in our glycogen tanks that's when the the fat starts getting stored right and typically i think in men certainly it starts getting stored around <laughs> around the stomach yeah around, around the iliac crest so the the, the sides uh, like women the the uh, abdomen yeah to, to, so yeah the love handles <laughs> yes yeah that's it yeah uh, so how many uh, how many players uh, do, are you uh, recommending protein powders to or do they all generally on days when or you do you all like is it an alternative for all of them is it a part of their their regular diet yeah it, it's an option for every player yeah so uh, whether they consume that like prior to sleep for example uh, so before bed we're trying to provide like a quality source of protein so optimize growth and repair processes while they sleep um so whey protein can be a, an easy option before they go to bed just to add the the powder to so milk and maybe blend it with some berries or something and then just drink that before they go to bed uh, that's going to optimize their recovery while they sleep or or it might be that they have to consume it after training because they, they they're going into a, another session after after they do the the, the field session so um yeah it, it's always an option but as i say it, it's not necessarily seen as as a supplement um there there are like other supplements like creatine for example or, or caffeine uh, beta alanine or nitrates for example which are probably seen as as supplementary to to the diet or like vitamin like micronutrients like vitamin d or, or iron for example um so they're like what you'd say are, are supplements because they're completing or complementing uh, the diet what are players eating at half time i've always kind of wondered is there is there a is there you know like tennis players do in between uh, sets games sometimes they'll have you know rafael nadal will have his is he will have half a banana there'll be some fruit juice or something like that just to kind of give you the energy for another set or in a footballer's case the uh, the rest of the 45 yeah so uh, at half time they have like three things to consider like footballers so they have to refocus uh, they have to rehydrate and then refuel um so refocus like in recent years uh, things like caffeine chewing gum so they 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 can chew on a, a caffeine caffeinated chewing gum uh, the caffeine chewing gum provides around 100 milligrams of of caffeine so that's like a one and a half espressos for example and that can allow them to to refocus like stimulate the central nervous system and uh and, and look at that like cognitive the, the mental aspect of the game um that rehydrates so fluids electrolytes uh, ideally combined with carbohydrates as well so a traditional like gatorade or, or lucozade um drink so that's going to allow them to, to rehydrate but then also 
allow them to refuel. Uh, and then refueling with with carbohydrates, so that Gatorade can provide some additional fuel. Uh, but like energy gels, um, chews, um, like bananas, things like that, uh, can, can be beneficial as well. And obviously, depending on their position, depending on their personal preferences, uh, they'll have like set targets or set products that they need to consume. Um, we, that's kind of refined and, and recommended like very specifically to even down to the flavor that they're provided. Um, we'll, we'll test various things uh, in, in preseason. Um, and most players, to be honest, will develop their own kind of habits, if you like, throughout their career. And they just repeat that uh, across all, all games. But um, yeah, every, every player will have a set target. Um, like some players consume around 50 grams of carbohydrate at halftime. Um, like goalkeepers, oh, for that's example. A lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's like one Gatorade, perhaps, um, and one energy gel. Um, like it could be even even more, like to be honest, depending on uh depending on their position. Like if I think like someone like Declan Rice, for example, they 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 probably more like 50, 60 grams. Um whereas a goalkeeper would be probably be 25 or maybe 30 grams of carbohydrate. So um yeah, it, it varies, but um generally speaking um like caffeine chewing gum um sports drinks energy gels i, I would call them like fast fuels uh, fuels that are going to be digested and absorbed rapidly uh, to allow them to uh yeah to be delivered to the muscle and the brain and, and optimize performance in the second half yeah and the timing of that can you give me within... an example yeah oh, sorry on, and the timing on. of that within the halftime period is also quite important uh because you don't want them to like Go like re, there's this thing called rebound hypoglycemia, where if you consume large quantities of carbohydrate while you're like inactive, while you're sitting down, your blood sugar levels can rise and then fall quite rapidly, and you can experience like like fatigue or lethargy when you're just sat down, which is uh, is not ideal. So you have to time the carbohydrate uh, towards the end of uh, the 15 minute break in order to uh, experience the mm -hmm. most benefits. Got it. Can you give me an example of uh, you know a player that you you knew? So you said that there's there are there's players who kind of have their own routine uh, over the years. They they that they tend to follow them. Uh, that a player that you've worked with, for instance, like who who you knew had this set routine. This is what they used to do at halftime. Yeah, uh, I I think everyone has the their own route. Like if I think uh, in the West Ham dressing room um like michael antonio he used to sit on an exercise bike uh during the the entire 15 minutes and just keep his legs moving uh he he consumed like 50 grams of carbohydrate uh he he liked to have them positioned perfectly so the drink would be on the exercise bike the gel would be next to it uh, and the the bike would be positioned perfectly so he can see uh see the the whiteboard or the screen whatever it might be that uh that the the coaches would present on so uh, that, I guess that, that, that's one example. Um, and then, but is that allowed uh, to? <laughs> are exercise bikes and stuff like that allowed in the dressing room? I mean, especially if you're playing an away game, is that ex someone's actually carrying that exercise bike for you? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So they they'd be transported uh, by by van, I guess. I mean, you can't put it on an airplane, can you? I guess so. Um, it would, <laughs> yeah. Someone would have to drive it. So even European games, like it would it would find its way there. Um, whether it be like we we lend one at the location or to be honest that kind of started in rugby so i'm not sure if you've ever seen like rugby games but um at, i uh, haven't on the, on the sideline there'd be a few exercise bikes and like substitutes would sit there and and pedal either before or after um like before coming on to the, like join the game or afterwards uh, as a bit of a cool down so um yeah i think like football's kind of uh, caught on from that really uh, so, particularly speaking of your time at uh, at West Ham, uh, was there ever a time when? How often do you uh, are you are you as the nutritionist required to, for example, uh, have a chat with with David Moyes? Is it like a weekly meeting that you have with him, kind of to just touch base about uh, you know what players doing what, so that the manager knows as well? Or has the manager ever come to you saying that this guy's looking a little slow? What's he on? <laughs> Is he not taking care of his diet and things like that? Yeah, yeah, uh, pretty much every day, <laughs> to be honest. 
Um, and like w when you say meetings, I think in, in football, like there are no like official meetings. Like the the meetings are very informal. It might be like at the coffee machine. You're, you're stood next to him and like talking about Got various it. things. It could be that you're you, you take breakfast or lunch with him. Um, but yeah, pretty much daily. Um, I think the the communication between all staff within within the football team, uh, both the medical, technical, physical, uh, it's essential. So um, being open to communicating, like in all scenarios, it might be in the toilet, it might be in the corridor, like wherever it might be, you uh, you're always like sharing information and and uh, yeah, and trying to progress the team and, and the players individually. What are your workers, for instance, if you're working at a Premier League club, uh, as the nutritionist, how often are you on the uh, at the club? And uh, because I'm assuming that you know when the players are actually training and things like that, like you might not be uh, required to actively be there necessarily, right? But I, I guess taking sessions uh, with the players all together sometimes to uh, make them understand nutrition or the, if there's something new that's come up that you guys are going to try. Things like that. So, what are your what do your work hours typically look like if you're working as the head nutritionist at a Premier League club? Yeah. So, I across my career, I've actually worked like both full time, so with with a with the team, with the club full time. So you're you're there all the time. But then I've also worked as a, as a consultant, where you just go in a few days and uh, and then the, the rest of the time you're you're not there. So um, there's there's pros and cons to both. I think like when you're full-time at a club you can often get like sucked into the more practical elements of like filling water bottles and making protein shakes and and those kind of things which in some ways almost detracts from your ability to make an impact uh, because ultimately okay. uh, the biggest the biggest impact that you can have is you can like spend time with players educating them um influencing their decisions like being present on the pitch to uh, like reinforce key messages uh, but it, sometimes if you're if you're full time at a club, then you can you can be like pulled away from those elements. Um, so, yeah, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, I think like in in the Premier League now, full time nutritionists are uh, it's more common. Um, and I, I like that. It's I think it's a, a great thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you probably would be there um, as much as any other like staff member from the medical team. Uh, you probably be out on the pitch as well during during training to reinforce key messages, uh, taking opportunities during breaks uh, in play during the training session itself to to reinforce messages about hydration and refueling. It might be the day before the game, so you're trying to encourage higher carbohydrate intakes, or it might be a recovery day, so you're trying to increase their intake of antioxidants or anti-inflammatory nutrients. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I like. I think uh, full, working full time, you're there as as frequently as uh, as much as uh, as any other member of staff. Got it. Uh, a couple of uh, interesting. Uh, well, I, I actually was tempted to say facts, but they they, they may not be. Uh, the couple of things that I wanted to ask you about. One is veganism, and the other is, um, well, what's it called the the, the fasting that you do for for long hours uh for like 14 15 hours uh, hour fast yeah. that you do. intermittent yeah yeah correct so these are the two things that i want to talk talk to you about because these are um two terms which we've heard very often in the last uh probably five seven years especially uh intermittent fasting and also veganism so are there any players who who are vegan and because i know that, they, that i'm sure there are right because novak Djokovic is and he's a top athlete so i'm sure that it's and in a, in a in a sport which is extremely demanding physically uh so can can the players uh, carry it off are there are there people, players who are doing that intermittent fasting i think it's kind of difficult for uh for a footballer to follow i guess uh wouldn't be ideal but what's your general take on uh, intermittent fasting for somebody who's who doesn't have uh, those kind of demands yeah, so I'll begin with a vegan diet. Yeah, there is absolutely uh, vegan players. Um, yeah, and to be honest, most most manage it quite well. Um, there ha there have been some that uh, don't manage it very well, and then they quickly realize that they they're not performing, their their health is being impacted, and then they they revert back to an omnivorous diet. So, um, but those that are well educated and and research it 
well and how to like manipulate or modify the foods that they're eating uh, they can they can manage it well and, and meet their protein requirements um to be honest because a footballer requires more carbohydrate than than most other athletes uh, they can actually probably get away with it more than than like a, a power-based athlete for example um because a vegan diet right. is plant-based it's higher in in carbohydrate naturally um whereas like the, the issue might be meeting uh, pro protein requirements but yeah th there are absolutely footballers that, that do uh, are able to do that and and from my perspective if they wanted to do it absolutely fine no problem but we just have to manage it well uh, we just have to like perhaps uh, like take blood markers more frequently uh, assess for intolerances or sorry not intolerances deficiencies more frequently um and yeah just kind of trial and error a little bit more um the intermittent fasting one is probably driven by the like the weight loss industry more so than anything um Correct. and obviously um footballers are like impacted by medium uh as as is anyone uh wives girlfriends might try it and then that might influence the player to to try it so um in in those cases it's uh, it it comes down to relationships and if the player is like has a good relationship with you and he hears about this this uh this new diet uh the, the chances are he's going to come and speak with you about it um before he tries it uh and you can talk to him about the pros and cons and uh, how it might not necessarily be uh, the best idea for him in his context uh or the player male or female um in their context um yeah, so it, uh, just about education and re reinforcing um, how in certain contexts it might be beneficial, but in their context, uh, it, it might not necessarily be that beneficial. But even in, in the weight loss context, um, an intermittent fasting diet might not even be that beneficial. So if you look at the long-term research comparing uh, an intermittent fasting diet to like a, a standard diet where you're eating more, more frequently, there is no difference in weight loss long-term um so like ultimately uh whatever it's like the amount of calories about, that you consume yeah like like diet diets if you like whatever name you want to give it uh they're just methods it's just a, a recipe or or an instruction manual it's a method to get you from a to b um there's many methods to get from a to b but the the, the underlying principles uh, are the most important things the the calories and the macronutrients Mm -hmm. and for for the players that are vegan I, I, i'm assuming that they they do consume a lot of like plant-based uh protein powders and stuff like that yeah in many cases that they would have to supplement their, their diet with a with a plant-based protein yeah so if we go back to the conversation about the the buckets um obviously if you're consuming just a vegan diet so plants you're going to be able to fill up that carbohydrate bucket quite easily uh, and also the vitamin and mineral bucket and the fiber, of course, uh, but the one, the other bucket, so the, the, the protein and maybe even the fat, uh, you might struggle with. So you have to, you have to supplement with, uh, with protein, vegan protein powders, like a, a pea or a rice protein. You just plug that in to fill up that bucket. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Matt, there's, uh, especially with with nutrition as it is i think with uh, with with exercise as well uh science it, it's something that obviously we know that there's there's basic principles like for example okay if you if you're going to have oats this is you know, this is going to be this is a complex carbohydrate that and that facts obviously it's never going to change like if you do a push up uh the, the you know you're going to work your chest that's never going to change for anyone doing it anywhere in the world it's always going to be the same but when it comes to nuance right uh there's there's people for example uh in an exercise context they say that more repetitions uh is actually more beneficial for generally people say that it's better for endurance uh and then there's uh, there's a completely opposite opinion these days as well which is that uh if you if you're actually doing more repetition that's better for for muscle and not necessarily for endurance there's there's lower repetitions right so science also i feel like it's always kind of changing uh so how do you as somebody who's in this industry 
uh, how do you keep up with that and do you have people coming up to you saying that you know what but what what say for example you had an opinion on intermittent fasting now i'm sure that there's some nutritionist out there who thinks intermittent fasting is the way to go so how how do you deal and is is this a constant learning process then for you as well yeah absolutely you you never stop learning i mean science is con continually evolving um science as it relates to nutrition and football and everything in life like naturally it will evolve and it will change um it will evolve like until we stop asking questions because ultimately science is just answering our questions so um and, and until the day comes that we stop asking questions then science will continue to evolve uh, but it's great because we, we're continually like learning things about ourselves and the world around us as well so it's fantastic so you have to you have to embrace that change um and it can often create like some um what's what's the word like uh like contradictory information because you, you like one year you might say one thing but then the science changes so then you won't, you have to change your opinion um and a, to a player yeah. that might seem like oh well you got it wrong then well no i i, I didn't get it wrong then the, the science said that at that time that this was the best recommendation, but now subsequently it's been disproven. So this is the new uh, the new way to do it. So as a practitioner, you have to be open to, to that change. Um, you can't like marry yourself to, you can't lock yourself in a box if you like. Um, you have to be open to that change. And um, ultimately, if you wanna be the best, you have to continue to evolve. Um, like as, as a coach or a player, you, you, your game evolves, your, your tactical principles evolve depending on like your learnings. Uh, and the same applies okay. with, with practitioners as well. Um, you, you have to, you have to evolve. Mm -hmm. Matt, two things that, uh, that people have that, that are misnomers in the, in the, in the fitness, uh, or the nutrition scene, like two myths that people, uh, that, that you want to burst here that you've seen a lot of people follow, but it's not actually true at all. Yeah. Uh, maybe like low carbohydrate diets, perhaps, um, like there's keto, a lot of keto diet. Yeah. Keto, keto diets, low carbohydrate diets. There's a lot of misinformation around those. Um, uh, and that has like consequences for, for athletes. Definitely. Um, and again, if you look at the research as it relates to weight loss, because most of the time people will adopt a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet in the hope of losing weight. Um, but long term, if you look at like the, the primary endpoint of weight loss or fat loss, uh, if you compare a low carb to a moderate or high carb diet, then there is well a moderate carb diet anyway, then there is no difference in, in weight loss long term. Um, so yeah, like low carb diet, I think that's uh, one of the yeah the biggest kind of the most uh biggest misinformation around uh, around those kind of things and i mean honestly the, there's so many to we, we could be here for days talking about them like dairy products there's a lot of like misinformation and scaremongering about around dairy products and and, and gluten um but then in those cases again you have to just think about the context um as we spoke about right right at the beginning in certain contexts, okay, a low carbohydrate diet might might be beneficial, or or a dairy free diet might be beneficial if someone's lactose intolerant. But um, in other contexts, for for another person, it, it's not a good idea. Um, people, as I say, they they box themselves in and they lock themselves to this this idea, this ideology, um, and they they become so indoctrinated by it, they they try and influence everyone around them. Um, and like, t to be honest, one of the most frustrating things that I see nowadays, like I, I don't often use Instagram, okay? So, but like now I go on Instagram and I see people eating off um, chopping boards. Have you seen it? Like wooden chopping boards? Uh, no. But, oh, it, it, honestly, it may, maybe it's just me being targeted with these crazy people, but they're, they're, they're eating like really strange things off, off chopping boards. So they'll rather than putting things on a plate they'll put it on a chopping board and they'll talk about how like primal they are and they're eating like organ meats and all these different things and it's like okay that's that's fantastic great good for you but like people don't necessarily need to eat this way so like just be a little bit more open-minded yeah 
uh, you know, there's this uh, uh, former uh, uh, mixed martial artist called uh, George Saint Pierre, who only eats uh, uh, who only eats animal organs. That that's mm. that's what he says. That's all that he eats. Uh, you know, so it it looks a little unrealistic for sure. I mean, for for most people, for for anyone really, because can't possibly be a wholesome diet which is eating animal organs right i mean it's okay if you're getting some protein you're getting some fat but you also like to, to your point it's very low carbohydrate there's hardly any fiber in it which is something that you know you, you can't really count fiber in as carbohydrates because you can't digest your food well without fiber yeah yeah that, that, that's another example like in in his context maybe he can get away with it but like if you if you told him to run him like i don't know like play a football game like a, a really intense repetitive con like compet like competitive environment he, he would struggle because his glycogen stores would be so low that he's he's not able to maintain those high intensities but um in, in the context he's able to to manage it um and he, he's doing okay but for sure he's uh like his digestive systems had to completely change. His microbiome has completely changed as well. Uh, probably not for the better, to be honest. Um, but yeah, again, there's like th these radical things that people do that they try and influence everyone around them. And and really they're, they're using like anecdotes rather than science to reinforce their messages, like how they feel. I feel amazing, but there's actually no research whatsoever to support what they're saying. Um, so that's where having like this evidence-based approach is, is incredibly important. And um, yeah, I, I'm being critical of like, whether it be a, some kind of celebrity or a sports star, be, be critical of what they're saying. Um, Cause like, okay, what they're saying might be inspiring. It might be, it might be nice to hear. It might inspire you to try it, but ultimately you you also have to be a little bit critical of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And lastly, Matt, uh, you know, we spoke about how science is always changing. Tell me something with all your years of experience now. One thing that you, one theory or one, you know, uh, way of uh, looking at nutrition that you thought was the right way, which after all these years, you've, you've kind of learned that maybe I have a different opinion, a different take on that now. Yeah. Um, I the, the significance of the pre pre match meal, I guess, in, in the football context, uh, I think like in in the early part of my career, I used to look at that as like a, a really, really critical time. Um, whereas now I'm probably a little bit more relaxed about the pre match meal. And um, if the preparation is done prior to that meal, then ultimately the, they can get away with uh, like a different quantity of carbohydrate, perhaps in that meal. And they're just topping up fuel stores um so yeah the significance of the pre match meal is probably my opinion of that has changed uh my my opinion of like supplements like sodium bicarbonate again has, has changed like i, I grew like in my uh, undergraduate and master's degree I, like i researched sodium bicarbonate so i was very like drawn into the impact of of bicarbonate as a supplement and i was bought in and almost boxed myself in <laughs> but then i like crit criticized myself and said no I, I can't box myself in um so i i critiqued myself and realized okay well in a practical setting sodium bicarbonate for footballers might not be that beneficial because it might result in them being sick or feeling uncomfortable um it, it uh, in on the other hand it can be incredibly beneficial so you have to kind of balance balance each uh, each mm -hmm. thing off each other but uh, that, uh, yeah that's another thing i've changed uh, changed my stance on but that won't be the last there'll be uh, there'll be many i'm sure yeah i'm i'm sure too all right uh, matt thank you so much this was so much fun uh, i had uh, an absolute blast doing this because uh, you know it's uh, i can't claim to you know understand or know too much about it but i'm certainly very very curious and inquisitive about you know diet and nutrition and certainly uh, with when it comes to uh, top sport and an athlete. So it was a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Prem. I, I also enjoyed it. It's uh, as I say, it's always nice to talk about uh, food and, and nutrition and uh, football, two of my uh, biggest passions. Yeah, so it's been good. All right, all right, uh, Mac, pleasure. Thank you.
Thanks. Goodbye.